welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, hey, listen, let's get into the word of the Lord. Uh, I know that's what you came for. You didn't come to hear from a man. You didn't come to hear from a woman, a young man, an old man, a black man, a white man, a tall man, a short man, skinny man or fat man. You didn't come to hear from a man. Okay, I think we got that covered. You came to hear from God. So listen, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you join me in standing as we go before the Lord in prayer tonight? Our dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you tonight, Lord, and we just thank you. Lord, first and foremost, we thank you for your presence in this place. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit in this place. God, we don't come into this church to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. God, we don't come to church to be entertained. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And Father, we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us tonight, to minister to us, to show us things in our lives. Lord, I pray that the word of God tonight would be a seed sown in our lives and in our hearts, uh, planted into good ground, that it would bear much fruit. Lord, that we would be uh, evident Christians uh, in the kingdom of God, Father, to the world and to those around us, that we would be a light upon a hill in a city that is not easily hidden. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done and all that you've continued to do here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center in the lives of each and every person in this place. And Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've given to us. Lord, at no time do we see ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co-laborers in the body of Christ. So Lord, the blessings that we ask upon ourselves, we don't ask them upon just ourselves, but Lord, upon every church all across the world and all around the Inland Empire that is preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Father, we thank you for our brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Adventist brothers and sisters, our Presbyterian and Baptist and Lutheran and Methodist brothers and sisters, our Episcopalian, Pentecostal and Charismatic brothers and sisters. Lord, tonight we lift up Harvest and the Grove and Sandals. Lord, we lift up Ecclesia Christian to you, Father Emmanuel Baptist. Father, we lift up all the churches all across the Inland Empire. Father, too many to mention around the world, but Lord, we know that we are all co-laborers in the body of Christ, all working together to, to, uh, to grow and to experience expand and to strengthen and to build the kingdom of God as you have called us to do. Father, we thank you for our churches, our brothers and sisters in Coachella, in Temecula, in San Diego, and South Riverside, and all the churches that have the DNA of this place. And Lord, we thank you that you would bless them today, Lord. And we thank you for our brothers and sisters all across the world, and especially our brothers and sisters tonight that are joining us from South Africa. Lord, we ask that you would bless them in teaching and spreading the word of God to their people, Lord, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, when we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, God is good. Excited for what God's got in store. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew in the 19th chapter. Matthew in the 19th chapter. Now, if you have a ribbon in your Bible, I would recommend you do two things. You don't have to, but I'm just going to give you a recommendation, okay? Right now, if you've got a ribbon in your Bible, turn to Matthew in the 19th chapter, put your thumb there, and then turn to King, 1 Kings in the 19th chapter. I'll just save you some time later on. I'm just kind of giving you a little heads up. Matthew in the 19th chapter. Tonight, the title of tonight's message is A Tale of Two Rich Men. Matthew, the 19th chapter, and we're going to talk for a minute about two rich men. We're going to look at the lives of two rich men and We're going to see some things, and I believe that there's some spiritual truths that we're going to talk about. Now, if you're just joining us at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, if you've come back uh, uh, from some time away or whatever, what might have you, you might look around and wonder what is the the freedom for our future and all these different things that you see all around the church and the orange and the gray and the buttons that everybody's wearing. And what what we find ourselves in here is the launch or the kickoff of a new journey here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Freedom for Our Future is a capital stewardship campaign. Capital meaning money, stewardship meaning management, where we are going to come together as a congregation. And now I say we are going to because I'm staying in faith that we are going to believe. We are believing God not just for a debt reduction or to reduce the debt of the mortgage on this building, but to pay it off so that we can be free for our future. So the, 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 ink, the insignia or the logo behind me, Freedom for Our Future, stands for three things, really four things. 
First one is freedom for the next generation, and that next generation is not the next generation of pastors or preachers, but really the next generation of people coming into this church. As the Rock Church and World Outreach Center comes into its 25th year of existence in June, we find ourselves now at a new place where we have solidified our place in the Inland Empire, and we have seen a great and a mighty work. And the average age of this church, if you don't know, is around 24 years old. If you've seen the altars at this church at any time, you've seen young people of all ages, of all walks of life coming and giving their hearts and their life to Jesus Christ. And we believe that we can secure this place so that we can have a legacy that goes well beyond 25 years and into the future for the next generation. The second idea of that freedom for the future is freedom from a financial institution. Did you know that we spent $87,000 a month on the mortgage of this building? The Bible tells us that the borrower is slave to the lender. And while our lender is a great lender, while they have done many things to help us and to work with us to make sure that we have a good and a mutual understanding in our relationship, we don't want to be subject to anybody coming and telling us how to do our church their way, but rather we do church God's way. So we want to secure our future. And could you imagine the third idea is freedom for more ministries. Could you imagine what $87,000 a month could do? A million dollars a year could do towards ministries here in the Inland Empire and around the world. What our missions programs could look like. What our outreach programs could look like. What our Spanish-speaking church, Iglesia La Roca, could look like. What the sanctuary that we could build. What our, what our children could be invested in by building them the Rock Christian School, a bigger and a larger school to have more kids so that we can teach them the fundamentals of education with a God-based uh, education system. The last idea kind of new. As a matter of fact, if you have a brochure, let me get that so just in case I'll tell you a little bit about that. If you have a brochure, you won't even find it there because it really kind of came to us on the week one. If you haven't grabbed one of these, grab one of these. They're free to every adult. We want you to have one of these after you exit. Right outside, you can grab this as well as all of the CDs from the four parts that we've talked about for free for you. We want you to get this and read it. But the fourth one is freedom for the heart. Because the Bible tells us that we cannot serve God and money. You will either love one or hate the other. And in our day and in our age and in our society, we find ourselves trapped. We find ourselves baited to follow after the systems of this world and things that are normal to the people around us. But what is normal is not necessarily right. And so we've been going on this journey of studying and of looking at finances in our lives so that we could see the freedom for our hearts, so that we could focus our lives more on Jesus Christ, more on the things that God has for us, and less on what we have, and less on money. And so as you hear this, you might think, oh, you know, it's easy for you to think if you're just joining us, oh, while well, the church, this is just another ploy for the church to get my money. Here's the deal. We're not after your money. We're not after trying to get every cent out of your wallet. That's not our goal. That's not our business. What we are after is growing the church. The church being you and I, the people of God. And if God uh, speaks so much about the finances and so much about material and possessions and wealth in the Bible, more so than many topics that you and I would think are, are major key topics, if God takes enough time to talk about them to you and I, that shows you and I that there is something about the heart. And something about the development of the heart. Billy Graham once said that if a man can get his financial situation in order within his heart, many other things in his life will follow suit. Because there are so many things that you and I live and, and do each and every day that are tied to our finances, that are tied to our wealth, that are tied to our possessions. So today we're talking about... The tale of two rich men. We're going to look at two rich men. Now, I had you turn to Matthew in the 19th chapter. Matthew in the 19th chapter. Matthew in the 19th chapter. And in the 16th verse, Matthew in the 19th chapter. There's a, if you have a Bible that has subsections, this talks about a rich young ruler that comes to Jesus. Matthew in the 19th chapter in the 16th verse says, Now behold... One came and said to him, speaking of Jesus, good teacher, good teacher, what good, what good thing shall I do that I may, be, may have eternal life? So he said to him, Jesus replies to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. 
Jesus goes on to say, and he said, or the, the ruler goes on to say, he said to him, which ones? Which commandments should I keep? And Jesus replies to him, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Some basic commandments. The young man says to Jesus, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Before we go any further, there's some things I want to point out. Before we even get into Jesus' response, before we even get into the tale of two rich men, let's look at some things. Let's look at some things about this rich young ruler. First off, verse number 16, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, what good thing shall I do that I have eternal life? Here's a person that is rich. The Bible will describe to him as, as a wealthy or man of great possessions. And here's a person that comes with great possessions with great wealth and his idea and in his mindset and the things that he has, uh, he has grown up in and he has been taught is that if I do good things, I will inherit eternal life. So basically, let's look at this. Let's just boil it down to the very root, to the very beginning, to the very essence of this statement. And what he is saying is, what can I do that I want to get eternal life? What can I do that I want to do? What good thing? I want to do good. I want to give to the poor. I want to do things that will make me look good. I want to be a philanthropist. What good thing must I do? And Jesus looks at him and he says, well, keep the commandments because he knows the state of this man's heart. So he tells him to keep the commandments, do what the Bible says. And the young man goes on to say, I've done these so the, the logical thing is if Jesus gave you an answer and your answer was, well, Jesus, I've done that, wouldn't it be case closed? But he goes on to say, what else do I lack? He knows. He knows in his heart. He knows in his being that there is something more than just good deeds that he has to do. But he's not ready for the answer. So a thought here, just a little rabbit trail of a thought, is before you ask God the question, make sure you ready yourself for the answer. Because let me tell you something. You may not get the answer you want to hear. So he goes on to say, The young man said to him, I have done all these things. I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Now this story is repeated in Mark, the 10th chapter, and in Luke, the 18th chapter. Now, as he says, what do I still lack? In Mark, the 10th chapter, the Bible tells us that Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, verse number 21, Jesus looking at him and love, loving him, and like what Mark tells us, verse number 21 says, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Jesus, the Bible tells us in Mark, the 10th chapter, looked at him and loved him. Jesus looked into his being, looked into his soul, looked into his existence, and loved him enough to tell him the answer to where he was at. This rich man had many possessions. This rich man was defined by what he owned, defined by the status in which he lived. And Jesus, looking at him and loving him enough to say, listen, I see where you're at, and the answer to where you're at is this, to get rid of everything that you own, give it to the poor, and follow me. And you will have treasure, not possessions, not wealth, treasure in heaven. Now the Bible goes on to say, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus gives him the answer. It's a hard answer. It's quiet in this place tonight because you and I know that's a hard pill to swallow. Now, let me tell you something. Let me just set you at ease for the rest of the night, okay? Let me set you at ease for the rest of the night. Pastor Luke is not telling you that you have to go and sell everything you own and give it to the poor, all right? You can sit back and take a big deep breath and go, because <sighs> that's not what I'm telling you. Now, that could be what God's telling you, but that's between you and God, okay? That's a different story. That's a different message. 
But you can rest assured that tonight I'm not trying to pull anything out of you. But what I do want to show you is the tale of two rich men. Now we saw one rich man. We saw one rich young ruler. And he had great possessions. He was defined by his possessions. And when he asked the question, God looked into his heart and gave him the answer specific to the area in which he was in. Understand that tonight? Let's look at the second rich man. I told you to turn to 1 Kings. 1 Kings in the 19th chapter. 1 Kings in the 19th chapter. 1 Kings in the 19th chapter. And here we find a man by the name of Elijah. Elijah has just had a great victory in the name of God. And he's seen some amazing things. And now Elijah, has, he's running from his life because after this great victory, he receives a threat. And so he runs and he hides in a cave. And he, there he has a moment where he seeks God and God and him converse. And God tells Elijah to go. And he will find a man by the name of Elisha. And he goes on to describe Elisha. Now let's look at this. 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, verse number 19. Elijah, so he, departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Saphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the 12th. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And Elijah's reply to him is, Go back, for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people, and they ate. And then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Let's take a look at this. Now the Bible tells us Elijah came and found Elisha plowing a field with 12 yoke of oxen. Now, I'm going to kind of put things into place for you a little bit, all right? You and I have a hard time going back 100 years. It's hard to recall what's happened in 100 years. Go back 200 years, 300 years, 400 years, 500 years, 600 years. I got no clue. You got no clue. You don't know what happened. I don't know. Because time has progressed. This is a time 900 years before Jesus and the rich young rulers conversation. So 900 years, almost 1,000 years prior to the rich young rulers. So you can imagine how society was different. You can imagine how technology was different. You can imagine how communities and civilizations had progressed in the period of a thousand years. Just look where we've come in a hundred years. So here we find a place where it says Elijah, Elisha, was plowing on the twelfth set of oxen, and he had uh, on the number twelve oxen, and he had twelve pair of oxen. Now, this is a, a farming or an agrarian society, which means that they lived based on the land. Now, if you had a land or a plot of land where you could farm. If you were the average run-of-the-mill person in this day and age, do you know how you plowed your land? By hand, with a hoe, with a garden hoe, okay? Now, if you were pretty well, if you had family, if you had kids, I remember when I was a little, when I, when I was a little child, my dad taught me the beauty of agriculture by making me mow the lawn every week. I used to think as a kid, man, my parents just had me to be slaves. Amen. <laughs> Hey, the Bible even says it, right? So, if you were well off and you had kids, then maybe you would even get a plow and the family would plow or pull the plow while you tilled the ground. So get the picture of your 8-year-old or your, hey, maybe you got a preteen. Get the idea of your 12-year-old or your 13-year-old or your 16-year-old, hallelujah, tie them up with a little bit of leather and let them plow the ground and you got the till behind them. Now, that was if you were well off, if you had a family. Now, if you... Were, were pretty do if you'd done well for yourself, you had an oxen. You had an oxen that would pull the plow behind you or in front of you, and that would, that would supply the power. In our day and age, that was like you had a riding lawnmower. You had a John Deere, green and yellow. You liked it. Now, if you were well off, you had more than one oxen. And here, Elijah finds this young man, Elisha, 
with 12 yoke of oxen. I remember I grew up in Ukaipa. I grew redneck. My mama had a yoke on, on the display. It was in the kitchen, I think, or something like that. An old antique yoke. It was this piece of wood that had a U-shaped piece of wood on each side of it. And they'd put the oxen or they'd put the cow's head on that and nail that thing shut. And those two oxen were like handcuffed together. That's a yoke of oxen. So you had two oxen, double the power. Now you got that four-wheel drive, big John Deere with the loader in the front too. All right, now you're moving some dirt. Elisha had 24 oxen. Elisha was an industrial superstar. Elisha had caterpillars, earth movers, combines, the things that you see in the Midwest, them big old John Deere tractors where the, the tires are like nine feet tall, that's what Elisha was rolling on. So let's not be mistaken, even though the Bible tells us the rich young ruler had a lot of possessions, the Bible tells us that Elisha was an industrial, agricultural superstar. And here's Elisha on oxen pair number 12, tilling the ground when Elijah comes and throws his mantle on him. Very similar. Here's two rich men. One had a lot of possessions. One was a rich ruler or a rich leader, a man of influence. One was an industrial or an agricultural leader, a man of influence. If you got 24 oxen, you're a man of influence. And here Elijah throws and he calls him. He throws his mantle on him as a signal to say, I want you to follow me. Like Jesus said, follow me. And Elisha says to Elijah, let me go kiss my mom and dad goodbye and I'll follow you. And Elijah says, well... Go and think about what has just been done to you. And as I was reading this story, let me point a thought out to you that I'd always read over. Elisha turned back, verse number 21, from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Jesus told the rich young ruler to sell everything you have and give it to the poor and follow me and you will have treasure in heaven. Elijah comes and throws his mantle on this young ruler and not only does he leave everything behind, he takes his well-being, he takes his source of income and slaughters it. Now, Elijah doesn't just take his oxen and find some sticks on the ground and rocks on the ground and build an altar. It says that Elisha took the yoke, the plow, and the equipment that he used with the oxen, which means he sealed the deal. Because remember, he had 12 oxen. Now, he took the yoke of oxen and he slaughtered them. So now he's got, if you do basic arithmetic, he's got 10. But he seals the deal by taking the yoke, by taking the plow, by taking the equipment and using that to build the fire, to burn the meat, to cook the meat, to give it to the people so that they can eat it. And he leaves everything behind and he follows Elijah. Yeah, sure. Two rich young men. One of them said, what must I do? And the answer was, sell everything and follow me and you'll find your treasure. One of them said, what must I do? The answer was get rid of everything, follow me, you'll have your treasure. Both of them had to make a decision. Both of them had a decision to make that would affect the outcome of the rest of their lives. And both of them made two completely different decisions. One of them made a decision to walk away because he was defined by what he had and he was walked away sorrowful with a heavy heart. Let me ask you this question. What is the influence of that rich young ruler to his people around him? What was the influence and in what he did for the kingdom of God? What was the legacy that rich young ruler left as he walked away knowing he couldn't give his heart and his life to Jesus Christ because he was defined by what he had? The second man had a decision to make and he made a decision to say, I will not be defined. I will not be looked at by the world's standards because it doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. I will get rid of everything around me to follow God. And he made a decision. And look, look, church, what God did in his life. Elisha was a world-known name. Did you know that Elisha is written in three different religious books? Not just the Bible. 
He's accounted and recorded in three other religions, holy scriptures. Because he was a man not just in the influence of the people of God, he was a world leader that affected secular kings and d made their decisions for them as well. He was a man that affected the outcome of a nation. He was a man that counseled kings. He was a man that had a great influence in his life, not because of his possessions, but because of God using him. You see, you and I have a decision each and every day in our lives. We have a decision. What are we going to do with what we have? What are we going to do with what we have? Now, tonight you might think that Pastor Luke is only talking about money. But let me tell you something. There's a lot more to life than money. There's a lot more that you and I possess than just money. Money's the simple part of life. Money is the replenishable part of life. You can make a million dollars and you can lose it just as, as fast, if not faster. As a matter of fact, money goes faster than it comes. Just go and, uh, just go and look on the internet and see about all of the people who have won the lottery. And where they are today. You and I know it. We all know you win the lottery. You think it's the end. You think that's it. That, oh, I got it. I got it. Everybody who wins the lottery ends up broke. Because it's not about money. You and I possess so much more in life than just money. We have time. The most valuable commodity in the world. The most valuable commodity in the world that you and I can possess is time. Why? Because money is replenishable. You can find love and you can lose love. The only thing about time is you only get what you have right now. You don't know if it comes tomorrow and you've already lost yesterday. All you've got is right now. It means that it's the most valuable commodity in the world. So when you think of possessions, how about thinking of time? How about thinking of relationships? How about thinking of influence? How about thinking of, of wealth? How about thinking of, of what you could do in as far as your legacy? These are what you possess because these are what God has in store for you. And you and I have got a decision each and every day to make. Whether or not we're going to be like the rich young leader or the rich young ruler or we're going to be like Elisha who says, I don't care what I have. What I have doesn't define who I am and I'm going to follow God. You and I have a decision each and every day to make. And as I've heard it said once before, that one decision precedes another and we have decisions each and every day to make. So quickly tonight, I don't want to spend a lot of time, but I want to give you three simple thoughts about the decisions that you and I have to make. Very simple thoughts. Now, I promise you, I'm telling you simple, simple, simple. Why? It's quiet tonight, but that's okay. I'm telling you this ahead of time so that you know where I'm going. These are, this is nothing that you don't already know but maybe it's something that you need to hear or be reminded of. Three simple thoughts that you and I have for our decision. And we're just going to go quickly through them because they're very simple. Three decisions, three simple thoughts that you and I have to do. Number one is to not limit God on our current status. To not limit God on our current status. Whether you're well off or down low. To not think that this is as good as it gets or this is all it is or it is what it is. Don't limit God on your current status. We read a few weeks ago that we can do that. Paul the Apostle said that he had learned to be content in life, whether he was in need or whether he had much uh, 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 grace or much wealth abounding towards him. Doesn't matter what he was, he knew how to be content in the things of God. Why? Because he knew that God was in control. And when God is in control, you know that you're not in control. And when you're not in control, it's God calling the shots. And like Matthew, the sixth chapter in the 33rd verse, it says, seek for First, the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. When you know that God's in control, you know that God takes care. So don't limit God. Don't li Listen, did you know that you could put a boundary on God? Because God's not going to do things that you don't want him to do. If you don't allow him to do it, God won't do it. God's not going to bless you when you're not serving him. Why? Because that'll keep you not serving him. You have got to put yourself in a position to not limit God by following God and by trusting God and allowing God to be the leader. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy in the 6th chapter. 1 Timothy in the 6th chapter. We're going to go through these pretty quick. Paul's exhorting the young, the young pastor, Timothy. In 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, 
Paul just says a very simple statement to Timothy. Verse Timothy 6, 6, he says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness, have a, having a form of righteousness, having a form of being like God with a sense of contentment, saying wherever I'm at, in whatever situation I'm at, whether I'm abounding or whether I'm in need, I'm okay because I know that God is in control. That is great gain to you and I. Godliness with contentment is great gain. He goes on to say, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Having food and clothing, with these things we shall be content. Now you may have heard this before, but do you know how they train elephants for the circus? Well, obviously there's a, little, there's a, there's a news article going out about electroshocking and things like that. I'm not talking about that. But did you know how they train elephants? It's a very simple process. When the elephant is just two days old, when the elephant is just two days old, they take a, a very large rope or a very heavy chain and they tie this baby elephant to a large tree or to a stake planted deep within the ground. And as this baby elephant uh, has his natural tendency to be a herding animal, to be a, a nomadic animal, to roam, to, to move and to graze, his instincts kick in and he tries to move and he fights against the chain and the tree or the stake in the ground and he finds himself in a position of not being able to break free or to move. And days and days and weeks go by as this elephant begins to slowly grow and he pulls against the stake, he pulls against the tree, he pulls against the rope and he tries to move and he tries to move and he tries to move and after a while he gets this idea in his head that I cannot move this tree. I cannot pull the stake out of the ground, and he gives up trying. Now years and years and years go by, and now this baby elephant is a great big elephant. And now all they have to do is use a tiny rope and a small tree that this elephant could easily pull up or easily uproot. But because the elephant has it in his head that he cannot break the rope, because he cannot move the tree, because he cannot pull the stake out of the ground, the elephant never tries. And you and I can get into that situation where we have hard times, where we have good times, and we think, this is as good as it's going to get. This is as bad as it's going to get. I've tried. I've put my faith out there, and I've pulled, and I've pulled, and I've pulled, and I was never able to break free. And then we give up, and we say, well, I guess this is what God has for me. And right then and there, we have limited God to step in and intervene in our life, and we have stopped trying to move forward. Don't be like that elephant. Don't stop. Don't limit God. Did you know that you could be blessed? Did you know that you could be blessed? Mark the ninth chapter, the 23rd verse just goes up on the overhead. I'm going through these fast. Jesus says, if you believe, all things are possible to him who believes. You can be blessed. You can be healed. You can progress. Today is not the limit. This is not the best of the best. This is not. You can go further than this, but you have got to believe. Don't be like the elephant. Did you know that you could be fulfilled in life? Jesus said in John the sixth chapter that I am the bread of life. He who comes shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. You can find fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Don't limit God by thinking that today is what, what you're at. Don't limit God by thinking that your past defines where you go tomorrow. No, God defines where you go tomorrow. Did you know that you could be influential? Did you know that you can influence those around you? Did you know that you could do a great and mighty thing for the kingdom of God? Jesus says to his disciples in John the 14th chapter, Most assuredly I say, he who believes in me, the works that I do, Jesus says, he will do also. And the greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. You can be people of influence, but don't limit God right now, church, by thinking that where you're at is where you're at, because it's not there. We're talking about decisions. Number two, the decision is ours. We have some decisions to make. The decision is ours. Number two, to not let our possessions define us. To not let our possessions define us. You and I live born, raised, and corn-fed in a society that tells us that in order to be happy in life, you have got to be successful. 
And when you are successful, you will then, by definition of success, drive a Mercedes Benz or a BMW or an Audi or one of the luxury brands of the car makers of America. Or even if you're more successful, then you get to move up to that Italian fine grain leather. We live in a society that tells us that the size of our house defines the influence that we have. We live in a society that tells us that the clothes on our backs and the extravagant colors and the brands and the names, the Gucci, the Prada, the Chanel that we wear defines who we are. And we become, you've heard the word, a status symbol. We have been born, raised, and corn fed to buy into the lie that your possessions define you. We live in a world of image, of entertainment. We live in a world that we strive for these things, for consumerism, consumption. We consume the products around us, and when they're no good, we throw them away and we buy new ones. That is the image. And when you buy a new one, you know what you do? You buy a better one. We live in that world. But you and I have got to not buy into the trap, to not buy into the lie that our possessions define us, that our wealth defines us, that our cars define us, that our clothes define us, that our homes define us. You and I have got to buy into the trap, not buy into the trap, that our jobs define us because God defines us, not the world system. Paul, as he's exhorting the young, Timothy goes on to say in verse number 9 of 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, those who desire to be rich, those who desire to be rich, fall. Listen to the words that Paul uses here. Listen to the words that you're about to read. Those who desire, big word, to be rich, big word, fall. Means, ouch, bumped my head. Fall into temptation, meaning hard times coming up. And snare, meaning trap. These are some big words for us. Riches, desire, falling, temptation, traps. Hello, I don't want to go down this road. But he doesn't stop there. Into many foolish and harmful, you want to go into stupid and harmful things, lusts, things that your flesh desires, which drown men in destruction and perdition, trouble. Almost every word in this verse is bad. <laughs> and it starts with those who desire to be rich. Those who desire to be rich. Because when you desire to be defined by the possessions, by the wealth, by the world standards, by what is normal in our day and age and what is normal in our society, rather than what is God, you find yourself falling into temptation, into traps. You find yourself suffocating to stay alive because you have been drowned out in trouble and destruction. Solomon, the richest man the world has ever seen, the wisest man the world has ever seen, the man that's seen it all, the man that's known it all, the man that's done it all, says this in Ecclesiastes, the first chapter. He says, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Can you and I hold the wind? No, we can't. All is vanity and grasping for the wind. Why? Because it is an illusion to be based off of your possessions. Because they'll be gone someday. When you're dead, guess what? It ain't yours no more. That's why we got wills and testaments, and that's why we got probate court, and that's why we got death taxes. Because when you die, it ain't yours. <laughs> Will Rogers says that too many people, Will Rogers said, too many people spend money they haven't earned to buy things that they don't want to impress people they don't like. Is that America? Is that you? Is that me? That's it in a nutshell right there. Too many people spend money they don't have to buy things they don't want to impress people they don't like. I was listening to a Ford Focus commercial, and the girl was talking about this commercial about this car, and she was saying, I just love driving down, and there's this little nifty thing where I can wave my foot and the trunk opens, and I like how everybody looks at me and says, wow, that's cool. Right there, they're selling it to you. They're spoon feeding it to you. You buy this product, you'll be cool. You buy this product, you'll look good. You buy this product, you'll be happy. You live in this city, you'll be there. You do this, you live on top of this hill. You have this big mansion, you drive this car. You got them 22 inch rims with spinners. You the man. When it's a lie, don't buy into it. 
Jesus says in Luke the ninth chapter, you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But you lose your life for Jesus' sake and, you, Jesus is safe, and you'll save it. Yeah. Don't buy into the lie. Last decision that we have tonight. I mean, there's lots of decisions that you and I make, but last one for tonight. Hallelujah. There's only three. Last decision that you and I have tonight is to have more treasure in heaven than on earth. More tre now, I'm going to use some words very carefully chosen here. To have more treasure in heaven than on earth. More treasure in heaven than on earth. Now, am I saying that you and I cannot have a goal to gain wealth on the earth? No, because treasure does not equal wealth. All right? If you, if you remember math, most of you don't. I don't even remember math. But there was this little sign that we used to see in mathematics that had an equal sign, the little two, you know, the little two bar, and with a strike through it. No. Treasure, no math. Or what is it? Treasure, no wealth. They don't equal. You get it? You get what I'm saying? Treasure, wealth, two different words. To store up, to have more treasure in heaven than on earth. Treasure doesn't equal wealth. We'll see that in a moment. Treasure is not wealth. First Timothy, the six chapters, we continue what Paul is exhorting to young Timothy. He says, First Timothy, in the sixth chapter, verse number 10, he goes on to say, the love for the love of money, the love of money for the desire of money, to have treasure in money is a root of all kinds of evil. All kinds, man, there's some nasty things, some atrocious things going on in the name of money. We know this, we see this all day long. For which some, listen to what he says, for which some have strayed. You know what that means? You know what a stray dog is? That means a stray dog got out of the yard and is gone. You and I have gone out of the yard and are gone. Some have strayed, have walked away, have gotten lost, and are now locked up in the dog pound because of it. For they strayed in their faith, in their greediness, and pierced, oh my goodness, and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The love of money has taken people from the faith. How many times, how many times have you and I seen people come to God on their knees in hard times? In hard economic times, in hard emotional times, in hard family times, they've come to God on their knees. And when times get better, when the job comes through, when the money starts coming in, when the relationships get restored, guess how fast they go back to where they came from. The human condition is insane. How fast can we forget where we came from? The love of money is roots of all kind. People have strayed because they have sought after riches, which lead to destruction and trouble. It's all about a heart realignment. You and I have got to have a heart realignment, a realignment. I just took my car in, and they told me that my alignment was out, and they wanted me to pay 80 bucks to get my tires to all face the same direction. You and I have got to get our heart facing the same direction as God so we don't wear out on the edges and, in, and deflate early. We've got to have a heart realignment. Now, remember I talked about treasure in heaven, not equal wealth on earth. Look what Jesus says. Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse number 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where, listen, this is it. This is the key. This is it. Here it is. Are you ready? If you get anything else, get this. For where your treasure lies, there your heart also. So when I said to lay up treasure, more treasure in heaven than on earth, the question is, where is your heart? Is your heart geared towards heaven or is your heart geared towards wealth? Because if your heart is geared towards heaven, then you're storing up treasures in heaven. And even though you may be at this present time or in the future accumulating wealth, it doesn't define you because your heart is not there. Because that's wealth. Remember I said wealth does not equal treasure? 
Because that is wealth, not treasure. Treasure is heaven. So heart is connected to heaven. Wealth grows on the side. Wealth goes away. Wealth comes, wealth goes, wealth comes, wealth goes, wealth comes, goes, comes, goes, comes, goes, comes. Doesn't matter. Why? Because your heart is connected to your treasure, which is in heaven. Connected to your treasure, which is in heaven. You have to have more treasure in heaven than you do on earth. 1 Corinthians 13 chapter, last thought for today. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, speaking the foundation of Jesus Christ, with gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear. At some point, you're going to build your life with time spent with either gold, silver, and precious stones, valuable items, you're going to use your time wisely, or you're going to build on the foundations of Jesus Christ using your time, your life, your wealth, your riches, with wood, hay, and straw. The Bible goes on to say, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. What happens to gold when fire hits it? It melts, but does it cease to exist? It stays gold. It actually purifies because all the dirt rises to the surface. Silver, does silver cease to exist when fire hits it? No, it melts and the dirt rises to the surface. What happens to diamonds and rubies when they're made in the fire? Do they, do they cease to exist? No, they don't go. But what happens to wood when it's revealed in fire? It burns. What happens to hay? when it goes in the fire, it's gone. What happens to straw when it's in the fire? It's gone. You and I have a decision. Remember I said it's not solely about your money, but about your possessions. Your possessions being your time, your influence, your relationships, your wealth, whatever God has given you. What are you going to do with this short time, this vapor that you and I have on this earth? Remember, we have a decision to make. And we can spend our time doing works and doing things in our life that leave a legacy far beyond us. You know, there are only two things that you can invest in that will outlive you. Not a home, not a car, not a stock, not a bond. Two things. One, the Word of God. Secondly, people. The Word of God, people. They're the only things that are going to outlast you. Companies come and go, they fall, they rise. Houses burn up, they fall, they rise. Cars, they fall, they rise all day long. <laughs> each one's work, will, it'll, it'll show each one's work what it is. If anyone's work has been built on it, it endures gold, silver, precious stones, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is born, burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. You have a decision whether or not you're going to spend this time on earth right now, the moment that you have in doing what's good for the kingdom of God, what's good for others around you, what's good for God in your life, which means investing in what God has you to do, like the rich young ruler or the rich young leader Elisha did, or you can spend it being defined by your possessions. You can spend this time being defined by what you own or by what you possess. You can spend this time building up treasure on earth. You can spend this time making bad decisions. The decision is yours. Jesus says, Luke the 12th chapter, to whom much is given, much is required. Let me leave you with this thought and we'll conclude on this. Steve Jobs said, being the richest man in the cemetery doesn't matter to me. Kind of odd. Going to bed at night and saying we've done something wonderful, that's what matters to me. He said that about computers, about phones, about iPods, things, wood, hay, straw. Could you imagine that statement for you and I if we built our lives out of gold, silver, and precious stones? for the kingdom of God. Each and every one of us have a decision to make. The tale of two rich men. Will we make the decision to follow God and not be defined by what this world says we ought to be defined? Or we make, will we make the decision to buy into the lies of this world, to buy into society's definitions of who we are and miss out on the opportunity? And like, Jesus, or like the Bible tells us, we might be saved, but we're going to suffer loss. The decision's ours, church. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight?
All right, Lay, let me do one more thing. I want to ask you a question, okay? Just give me a moment more. Let me ask you this question. It'd be a shame for us tonight to get together to hear the Word of God and to, le to leave this place tonight without giving you the opportunity to examine your eternal situation with God. So let me ask you this hypothetical question. If you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, heaven forbid that be the case, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? You know, it's a relatively simple question, but why don't we go over some of those answers that you might have had in your heart or your head? Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can get to heaven because you hope so or because you think so or because you want to? You can't get to heaven because you hope so, because you think it hard enough or because you want it bad enough. You won't find that in the Word of God. Did you know you can't get to heaven because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, or as a Muslim, or any other type of world religion? So that means by default that you're going to get into heaven because you're a Christian? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. You can't get to heaven that way. Hey. Did you know that you can't find yourself in heaven because your parents took you to church as a kid, because you were baptized as a baby or christened as a baby, because you attended Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes? You can't find yourself or you won't find yourself in heaven because your parents told you that you were a Christian because you went to church on Christmas and on Easter. Hey, you can't get to heaven because you got a cross or a St. Christopher or a Jesus tattoo somewhere on your neck or on your body. Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that you can get to heaven any one of those ways. You can't get there that way. You see, it's not about what you and I do on the outside, like that rich young ruler that said, what good thing must I do to get into heaven? There's more than just good things to get into heaven. You and I might even think, you know, well, Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. I've done good deeds. I've never robbed the 7-Eleven. I've never, I don't speed over the, on the freeway. I've never cheated on my taxes. Great, I'm glad. But did you know that good people aren't, aren't going to go to heaven because they're good? As a matter of fact, there's a lot of good people in hell. Why? Because the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. You see, nothing you and I could do on our own would ever make us good enough to get to heaven. It's not about how good you and I are. There's more to it than that. Just like Jesus said to the rich young ruler, there's more to it than that. You might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I served in my church. I was an usher, I sang in the choir, I carried the pastor's Bible, I've memorized John 3.16 and a few other verses, I know who God is, I know about Jesus, I know all those things. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Did you know that the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is? The devil quoted scriptures to Jesus, yet he's not going to find his way into heaven because he knows who God is. You can't get to heaven because you carry the pastor's Bible or because you serve in the choir or the youth ministry or the children's ministry at the church. There's more to it than that. Why? Because God is not after your mental assent or your carnal knowledge of who he is, but rather God is after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. Jesus spoke to a religious leader at his, of his day, a man by the name of Nicodemus, a man better than any of us in this room, a man that had memorized scripture, that had done good deeds, that had, had memorized more scripture than you and I could think imaginable, gave to the poor, uh, served in the temple, served in the, the religious synagogues of his time. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. There it is. That's how we do it. That's how we find ourselves in heaven. Well, you say, man, Pastor Luke, I've heard that term born again. Hollywood, popular culture, society, they've made, they just, that's the weirdo, crazy, out of control. I don't know if I can do that. Listen, I don't care what Hollywood says. They have no concept of God. The Bible, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, uh, uh, when it comes to born again, has always, listen, has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, in the last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to the church and he says to the church, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Shocking statement from the mouth of Jesus Christ. And what he is saying is when it comes time for you to meet him face to face, he better find you in or out. He better find you hot or cold because if he finds you lukewarm, he will reject and eject you from the kingdom of heaven. Jesus Christ is saying that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let's define that in terms of your relationship with God. You're a little bit in, you're a little bit out, you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down. Occasional church attendance, doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing, floating back and forth, to and from, in and out of church. You've got too much of the world in you to enjoy the things of God. You've got too much of, of the things of God in you to really enjoy the world. You're riding the fence right down the middle. And Jesus Christ says that that's you. You are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into heaven. And I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough today to tell you the truth, to tell you like it is so that you don't miss out on the opportunity in thinking that you're going to make it when you really don't. So then how do we get there? 
can't get there your way. Hey, you can't get there my way. Some well-meaning church committee or author's way. The only way we can get to heaven is God's way. It's God's heaven. It's God's way. And Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way. Today, let's do it God's way. And I want to give you that opportunity in just a moment, if that's you in this place, to ensure your place in heaven leaving hell behind. You know, you might say, Pastor Luke, I don't know that hell exists. I don't even know that hell exists. Listen, just because you don't believe it exists or because you're not sure about it doesn't mean it's not real. You could grow up in a place where you've never seen a semi-truck yet you go stand on the slow lane of the freeway and lo and behold, you'll meet one face to face whether you believe it or not. I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough to be in your face, to tell you the truth. Like Jesus who said he, said he, he loved him and he told him the truth, the rich young ruler. It doesn't matter if you believe it's real or not. Heaven is a real place. Hell is a real place. It was not designed for you and I. It was designed for the devil and his angels. Don't go to a place that wasn't designed for you. So how do we get there? I'm glad you asked. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and I count to three. I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on the Bible just like that, real loud. And if that's you in this place, I want to give you the opportunity to give your heart, to give your life to Jesus Christ, to make him your Lord and Savior. And when I count to three and I smack my hand on the Bible real loud like that, bang! Here's what I want you to do. I want you to be bold. I want you to pop your hand up. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart. Pastor Luke, I want to give him all of my life. I want to leave hell behind. I want to make sure tonight, Pastor Luke, that I'm going to go to heaven. I want to make Jesus Christ the personal Lord and Savior of my life. I'll see your hand in a moment. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. You say, Pastor Luke, I, I, I don't know if I could do that. I'm going to be embarrassed. You know what? You might be embarrassed because you put your hand up, but get over it. Wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? You see, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. The decision's yours. God's not a manipulator, a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. You have got to choose him and allow him to be the Lord and Savior of your life. That's your free will choice today. Who should raise their hand if you've never given them all your heart, you've never given them all your life in a moment? When I count to three and, pop, and slap my hand on the Bible, get your hand up so I can see it. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, and put it right back down. Who should raise their hands if you're not sure? Or maybe you did this and you never followed through. Maybe you did it at a harvest crusade or a Billy Graham crusade, but you've never followed through. You've never really done this. Go ahead and pop your hand up so I can see it. I'll acknowledge it, put it right back down. Who should raise their hand if you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing? Hey, quit playing games with God. Stop messing around and get your hand up. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge and put it right back down and ensure your place with God forever in heaven, leaving hell behind. The decision's yours. You might say, Pastor, look, I feel like you're pushing me. I feel like you've been driving me and manipulating me. Listen, I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm not trying to do anything, but I am pushing you. Why? Because the devil's trying to push you to shut up and keep your hands down. And I love you enough to tell you, to tell you like it is, to push you and be aggressive about it so that you get your hand up and you miss out of, he and, miss out of hell and you get into heaven for the rest of, of, of eternity. But the decision's yours. I can't make you. The person next to you can't make you. It's your decision. So here we go. If that's you, get ready. Hands are getting ready to go up in this place. Ready? I'm going to count. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. I see you. One, two. I see you right there. Let me see your hands. Three, I see you. Four, I see you right there. Four wise people. Let me see your hands. Five, I see you. Six. Oh, I, I got you. Five wise people right there. If you got your hand up, let me see it. Come on. Anybody else in this place today? Five. I know there's more than five of you in this place. Where are you at in this place today? You say, man, I wonder if I should. Come on. Stop playing around with God. Stop messing around with God and get your hand up today. Let's make sure today, five wise people, anybody else in this place tonight? Anybody else in this place tonight? You say, I want to go forward in my relationship with God. I want to leave hell behind. You say, man, I'm not sure, Pastor. Look, I'm just not sure. Hey, listen, make sure today, get your hand up. Let's go forward with God. Anybody else? Five wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. Anybody else in this place today? Anybody else today? I'm going to close this up. I don't want to miss out, but I know you're in this place. Oh, come on. Come on, if that's you in this place. Anybody else tonight? Anybody else? Five wise people. I'm going to finish this up in just a moment. Well, praise God for five wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. If you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, you don't get saved by raising your hand. You said, I want to give him my heart. I want to give him my life. You've got to give him your heart. You've got to give him your life. Let us help you. If you're serious about this, here's what I want to do. In a moment, we're all going to get together. We're all going to stand, and we're going to sing a song. As we do, if you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, you're serious about this, I want you to be bold. Get your sweater, your coat, your, per your, coat, your purse, your Bible, your uh, friend, if you need a friend. Get out of your chair. Get into the aisle, and come and meet me here at the altar, and let's change destinies together. Let us pray with you. Let us help you in this place today. So why don't we all stand? Please, nobody leave as they come forward. If that's you. Come on, you come. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair and come and meet me up here at this altar. Come on.
You come. Come on. Come on, you can come. If that's you, you come. Come on. Praise God, you came. You are here today. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Hey, you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today you're going to be born again. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy waving at you right over here? This is Pastor Joel, like Noel Joel. Jo Pastor Joel is a really cool guy. He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. And listen, I promise I am as weird as it gets, okay? You survived me. You did the best part, okay? Now, if you go right over there, Pastor Joel is going to pray with you, okay? He's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free things, and he's going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at the church. They're going to help you get strong in the ways of God, teach you some things so that you don't go back to the life that you came from. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over here with Pastor Joel. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.